Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm J.D. Vance, for those of you who are really terrible at context clues. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I wrote this book when I was having a first-year experience of my own, and that was as a first-year student at Yale Law School, which I know is much different in some ways from being a first-year student in college. But for me, it was a really transformational experience in my life because it was really the first time that I had ever felt like a cultural outsider. For my entire life, I had grown up in a community of people who were basically like me, who were different here and there in, in, in certain ways. But it was at law school where I first felt that I, I looked around and I thought, I don't know how to conduct myself at this place. I don't know who these people are. I don't know why they're here. And frankly, I don't know why I'm here either. And the, the corollary to that question is if I felt like such a cultural outsider at a place like Yale Law School, an institution like many of the institutions that you folks serve, which is a gateway to many of the opportunities in our society, then it must be the case that there were very few people like me at places like that. And I thought that implicated something very significant about how I perceived not only myself and my community and my family, but about the American dream and the America that I, I knew and loved. If it was so hard for kids who grew up like me to thrive in places like that, then something about the American dream, this idea that poor kids can rise through the, 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 the effort of their own conduct, through their own hard work, then something about that ideal didn't quite match up with the reality on the ground. So I started to look in some of the academic literature, and I, of course, realized that upward mobility in the United States is not doing quite as well as, as many of us would hope. Kids who grow up poor in the United States are not quite as likely to achieve material success as many of us would like, and that's especially true in certain regions of the country. If you look at a place like Utah or Kansas or San Francisco, where I lived for a couple of years, you see that upward mobility in these areas is actually doing okay. Poor kids are doing okay. But if you look at the area of the country where I grew up, Appalachia, the Rust Belt, the Southeast, poor children of all races are actually doing very, very poorly when it comes to actually escaping the circumstances of their birth. So I wanted to explore that. I wanted to understand why that was happening. And I really wrote this book in an effort to think through what are the things that were happening in my life that made it so hard for me to do especially well. And there were a few answers that stuck out. The, the, the big, broad, general answer is that it's complicated. Uh, there were many, many factors that were impactful, many things that were sort of holding me down in, in different ways. One of them is what economists and sociologists call social capital, this idea that the networks of friends and family that we have ha actually have real economic material value. Uh, but my economic network, my social network, didn't have a whole lot of value, at least when it came to translating especially well to the next step, to further education and so forth. I remember the first time that I actually had a fancy meal at a restaurant. It was at a law school law firm recruitment dinner. And beforehand, there was a sort of cocktail reception, not different from the one out outside uh, just a couple of hours ago. And someone came around and asked me, would, would I like some wine? And I eventually worked up the courage to say yes. And then she said, would you like, uh, and I said, sure, I'd, I'd like some wine. I'll take the white wine. And she said, would you like Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc? And I remember in the moment thinking to myself, is this woman screwing with me? <laughs> but then I used my powers of deduction and realized that actually those were two separate types of white wine. And so I ordered the Chardonnay, not because I, I didn't know what Sauvignon Blanc was, though I didn't, but because that seemed like the hardest one to pronounce. <laughs> and that's a, a funny story, and it's obviously meant to be funny, but it also conveys something important that when you're in these sorts of environments, what really matters is fitting in, knowing how to navigate this world. And I just didn't know. I didn't know how to find mentors. I didn't know which jobs I should be applying to. I didn't know how to conduct myself at a professional dinner. These are just things that I didn't know. So social capital was one part of the story. There's a family trauma side of the story that a lot of folks in my community don't like to talk about, but I think is really important. If you look at the data, working class kids like me face much higher instances of childhood trauma. And the more that we learn about childhood trauma, the more that we know that it affects not just children when they're in that trauma, but it has really significant consequences for their brain development, for the way that they perceive conflict in their own families and in their own lives, in their own workplaces. Childhood trauma is the sort of thing that not 
that doesn't just affect kids and make them miserable, but it is in a lot of ways the very worst gift that folks like my family give to their children, and it is unfortunately the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I was 12 years old the first time that a person um, came to my home, a child welfare worker, and told me that unless I, uh, th that if I kept telling the child welfare agency the things that were happening back home, then I was going to get yanked out of my grandma's home, my grandma who had begun to take care of me because my mom wasn't quite able to. And she said, if you don't stop talking, we're going to yank you out of that home and we're going to send you with a foster care parent. And that's quite a, quite a choice to give a 12-year-old kid, separate yourself from the only family that you've ever known, the only people who have ever really cared for you, or just shut up and stop talking about all the bad things that are going on at home. And so I shut up, and luckily I was okay because Mamma was willing to take good care of me. But a lot of kids who grow up in that circumstances, they don't have quite the benefit that I did in that circumstance. If they shut up, they're trapped in the home that they don't want to leave, but that home continues to have really negative consequences. The really terrible thing about childhood trauma is that I expected that its effects would go away as I got more money or as I achieved some measure of credential. I thought that the moment that I got into Yale Law School, I had escaped this terrible family tradition. I was better than where I came from. But as I learned, as I fell in love for the first time to the person I eventually married, that all of the terrible lessons that I had learned as a kid, I started to replay and reenact in my own life. I didn't go to Yale Law School and become a different person. I went to Yale Law School and I was the same exact person who grew up in Southwestern Ohio who didn't learn from his family how to treat your children, how to treat your spouse, how to treat the people you loved. So I did all of the things that I learned. I yelled and I screamed. I used hurtful words when I should have been more constructive. I didn't fight or argue to build some measure of trust. I didn't fight or argue to solve a problem in my relationship. I fought and argued to win. I was there to score points. I was there to hurt the other person because that's the way that I had grown up arguing in my family. That's what I had seen in my own community. Beyond the family trauma element, there's, there's a problem with civic institutions in these communities. Uh, we, we think, for example, of the church as incredibly vibrant in the Rust Belt, in the so-called Bible Belt, in these areas where folks are traditionally conservative, they vote Republican and so forth. But if you actually look at the data, even though people self-identify in an overwhelming level as evangelical Christian, they're not going to church that much. And we may say that's not a big deal. A lot of us, I'm sure, aren't necessarily that religious. But if you look at the data, the kids who go to church are much likelier to avoid addiction, to graduate from high school. And that just speaks to the fact that it's important to have an institution in your community where you share some fellowship with people, where you spend time around people that where they inculcate values, where they can support you, where they can add things that maybe you don't get at home, but there are other places out there where you might be able to get them. And if churches or other community institutions fall apart, then those things don't necessarily exist. Another part of my story is addiction. If you turn on the TV today, it is impossible not to hear stories about what has happened, especially in white poor communities with this terrible opioid addiction. And of course, something similar happened to black communities 20 or 30 years ago with the crack ep epidemic. Um, and now that it's come to white families, folks are talking about it a lot more. I think that's an indictment of our society in a certain way, but it's no less painful and no less traumatic now than it was 20 or 30 years ago, and it leaves its mark. In Ohio, the leading cause of death now, accidental cause of death, is heroin overdoses, not gun violence. In the county where I grew up, Butler County in southwestern Ohio, heroin overdoses killed more people than nature, according to the county coroner. This is a terrible epidemic, and it tears apart families. It tore apart my family. It makes it harder for parents to care for their children. It sends children to the homes of grandparents and aunts and uncles who didn't plan for it. And consequently, it plunges a lot of elderly folks into poverty who were planning to live on their social security check, but now they've got to take care of two grandkids like my grandparents did for me. There are a lot of other things that happened in my world, and there are a lot of other things that happen in, in my community that make it harder for these kids to get ahead. Of course, one obvious answer is that if you look at the regional economies, something I talk about in the book, in the Rust Belt, in the industrial Midwest, 
the manufacturing base that a lot of these areas depended on has really disappeared. So if you graduate from high school and you don't go on to college, it's really hard to get a good job. All of these things matter. All of these things make it harder for kids who grow up like I did to get ahead. And I think that unless we acknowledge that fact, then we're going to continue missing the boat and missing the real problem that goes on in a lot of these kids' lives. So that's why I wrote the book. Now, people very often ask me for solutions. What are the things that worked for you? Why are you able to live the life that you're able to live now? And very often, folks will look at me and say, look at you. You've pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. You've lived the classical American dream. And while it's, it's certainly hard to not say, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm a really great guy. Con <laughs> congratulations to me. The, the truth is that if you look back on my life, it's not a story of how a kid pulled himself up by his bootstraps. It's a story of how 20 or 30, probably more things, had to go right in sequence for me to have much of an opportunity. I talked a little bit about my grandparents. Mamaw, that was my grandmother as we called her, was a classic Appalachian matriarch, the sort of woman who did, wasn't just in charge of a nuclear family, but was in charge of an entire clan. I remember when I started to hang out with one of the bad kids in the neighborhood, a kid who was smoking pot when we were 11, and I tried it with him a couple of times, she found out that he was smoking pot. And she told me, JD, if you don't stop hanging out with this kid, I'm gonna run him over my, with my car and no one's ever gonna find out. <laughs> now, <laughs> I don't believe that she would have harmed an innocent young kid but I do believe that I believed that she was going to, and so, I stopped, <laughs> and so I stopped hanging out with that kid. She, she recognized that everything that was going on in my life was having a negative effect. She recognized that I was starting to give up hope for myself. Because even though it's an amorphous concept, it's really important for a kid to actually believe that their effort matters, that their hard work can actually produce positive outcomes in their lives. And I started to lose that hope. Because I looked around me and no one was doing well, no one was really going off to college, no one was living a successful life, and why would I think it was possible for me? But Mamaw encouraged me constantly to recognize that, f that life might be unfair for a kid who grew up like me, but that I still had some reason to hope, I still had some reason to try to work hard and to get ahead. That was one thing that saved me. I had a sister who, six years older than me, really served a motherly role in my life. I didn't know it when I was a kid, but Mamaw and Papaw, as my grandma and grandpa, installed a phone in her, my toy box and only told Lindsay so that when things got too chaotic at home, they could, she could run and call them in secret and they'd know when to come over to stop things from getting too crazy. Imagine the responsibility of an 11-year-old child doing that because she's afraid that her five-year-old little brother is going to be overwhelmed, going to be consumed by all the craziness in the home. My aunt and uncle stepped in and played a major role in my life. I had Pell Grants that helped me get to college. I had the United States Marine Corps, which taught me not just things about shooting a gun and how to conduct myself in warfare, but actually taught me really soft skills that I didn't pick up for my community. I remember the first time that I ever bought a car because I went to a, a car dealer and I was going to accept a dealer's interest rate of 21.9 percent. And I went and told my gunnery sergeant, my sort of officer in charge, I said, Gunny, I'm going to get this new car, 21.9%. He said, stop being an idiot. <laughs> Go to the credit union, get a lower interest rate, and get a car that way. And so I did, and I got a much lower interest rate. That financial sense, that way of navigating the world that's so important that so many kids learn from their families or their communities, I just didn't know. The Marine Corps helped close that gap. I had a lot of mentors, people who stepped into my life and made sure that I knew how to navigate a place like Yale Law School, that I had the right recommendations to get to college and get to law school in the first place. Teachers, people just constantly finding a way to help me. And of course, I had, like I mentioned Pell Grants, I had the GI Bill. I had a lot of other access to programs that really helped me as well. So in other words, a lot of things had to go right for me to, to, to have the opportunities that I've had. It's not just one thing, it's not just 20 things, uh, it's a lot. And I think if we don't f appreciate that, if we don't appreciate how really hard it is for a kid who grew up like I did to have much of an opportunity, then we're gonna find ourselves in the situation that we find ourselves right now, where kids from across the demographic spectrum in this country are increasingly feeling trapped in communities that don't offer much opportunity, and they're lashing out. They're lashing out politically, they're lashing out culturally, and that's not good for any of us. It's not good for us at the top of the, 
at the top of the, the socioeconomic ladder, and it's especially terrible for the kids at the bottom of that socioeconomic ladder. The last thing that I, I want to say is that I don't offer many solutions in my book. This is not a policy book. It, is, it was not meant to answer all of these questions because, frankly, I thought it would be a little disingenuous of me to write 250 pages about the problem and to immediately pivot to solutions when I don't necessarily know what those solutions are. I don't know what those solutions are because I think the problem is complex. But I do hope that the book encourages folks to ask the right questions, to be really wondering, what did, how do we give kids better access to mentors? How do we give kids better access to social capital? How do we spare children who grow up in addicted homes from the worst consequences of that addiction? For people who grow up in really traumatic families, how do we lessen the trauma of those families? For families that dissolve, how do we make it less likely that they dissolve in the first place? But if they dissolve anyway, how do we spare those children from the worst consequences of it? And of course, how do we bring better jobs, better employment prospects, and so forth to the communities that really need them? These are difficult questions, and I don't have all the answers in my book, but I do hope at least that somebody who picks it up and reads it is motivated in the same way that I was when I started writing it to really understand the scope and the nature and the complexity of the problem. I know, of course, that you guys are all involved in the first year experience for students. And so because you're so influential in shaping young minds, including many young minds that are probably not that different from mine when they first came into college, I, I really I salute you guys. I thank you for what you do on behalf of those kids. And most of all, I'm rooting for you because all of us need it, not just the kids who are at the bottom. Thank you.